I'm Eric Snodgrass, Principal Atmospheric Scientist with Nutrient Ag Solutions, and I want to thank you for watching this weekly Ag Weather Update brought to you by the Farm Credit Associations of North Carolina. Now, before we dig too far into this forecast, i got to take you back to Friday when we had this large low-pressure system sitting right here over the Midwestern part of the United States. Now, what we dealt with was what, what we call an upper-level front that swept through, and that's what brought in our precipitation over here into the Carolinas. But wrapped around the back side of this was a what we call a stacked low, which means the upper-level low, way up in the jet stream level, sat right on top of the surface low. And so the whole thing took forever to move off to the East Coast. Now, before I go any farther than that, I do have to show you this. Because if we zoom in here with our high-resolution satellites, we can see this large dust storm that came out of Colorado, clipping parts of Kansas uh, into the Oklahoma and Texas panhandles. Now, some of this uh, dust actually made it all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And just before you start singing, you know, some, some Kansas dust in the wind here, I at least got to show you what it looks like to be in a dust storm like this. Because we got some good footage out of this from Nora. She was in Winona, Kansas. And as you can see here, that dust um, really uh, very optically thick and made visibility, um, you know, what, maybe 50 to 100 feet before you can't see much anymore. So very impressive uh, system here that moved through the middle part of the country. Now, why this is so important is because it brings us to an update here on our drought monitor. So as we look across the United States, we still have over 60% of the country in some form of drought. And the drought in the western part of the United States, especially there around the four corner states and surrounding states, is quite extensive. And that dust storm came out of Colorado right here. Now, improvement in the drought has been occurring in the southern plains. You can see that over the last couple of months, we've made up to a two to three class improvement in the drought monitor in Texas. And that's critical for our upcoming growing season here. And it's going to also be critical for the pattern that I'm going to be talking about here in the near term. But my first question is, what got us here and, and what's missing and, and what's been present in this pattern? Because the forecast the newest one from the IRI Multimodel Group out of Columbia University uh, gave us this update for February, March, and April. So what we can see is no relief overall in the drought condition across Southern California and the Four Corner States, according to the model. But they continue to hang on to this idea that the La Nina is going to keep this area dry. Now, we certainly have not started out that way in 2021, especially as we get over to coastal parts of, of North Carolina. But that's what we see. Then the model really focused in on above average temperatures for us for the remainder of our winter here. Now, remember, to be above average in winter still means it's cold. But this is just saying that shots of brutally cold air are limited. And we're going to make a couple of points about that in the next couple of minutes here. So the pattern, let's discuss it. From the beginning of December through mid-January, let's look one mile above our heads at the flow. Now, this is what it's done. It's come screaming across the Pacific, cut into British Columbia, came over the Rocky Mountains, and then accelerated back into the North Atlantic. What it has not done is made a deep dive straight to the south between the Hudson Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. Part of that's been due to this. You see, if I flip this over to an anomaly map, so now this is what we would see in comparison to normal. These strong winds out of the east, okay, they're going in this direction. That is the effect of La Nina. And the jet stream here, if you just look overall at our flow, this is the anomalous flow. It's just not coming straight from the north. This is what's prevented us from going over brutally cold. Now, let me show you what this line needs to look like from midsummer on. As I animate this forward, you can see here that the coolest waters are now making their biggest push here, where we still have those strong trade winds. But if you come back over to this side of the Pacific, we're starting to see things uh, warm up a bit. But I want to talk to you about this feature right here because it's going to be the warm water we see here. I know it's in the Pacific, but that's going to be critical to our pattern. Plus the warm water we have in the North Atlantic that I think is going to set up our, our, our pattern moving forward. And this is what I'm talking about specifically. You see, normally La Nina years produce a lot of cold water that occupies everywhere that I just shaded there. But what we've noticed is that inside of this box right here, okay, just kind of color that in, that since the 1970s, there has been an increase in total ocean heat content in that area, such that even big La Ninas, like the one we had back in 2011, are actually still warmer than the climatological average. And what that means is that it's getting harder and harder here in the longer term to make this body of water really cold. Now, why we care about that is that our, our weather comes from that direction, right? So it's going to set up the position and strength of the jet stream. And this year, it's what's been bringing across much of the United States the more, well, the more mild conditions. 
And you look at this. Now, I know we're looking right down to the North Pole, but this is not what a La Nina typically brings. In fact, you could argue that it's the opposite, where we've had some cooler days south and warmer days north. Normally, it's the opposite during a La Nina winter. But it's only the front half of winter that we've gone through right now, and the second half is about to begin. But notice this. While we've had such mild conditions compared to normal again across Canada, all the cold air has been here. It's been over in Siberia. It's been in Russia, China, Kazakhstan, that particular area. And when we think back about the last time we had brutally cold air, that set up shop across, well, much of the Midwest over to the Southeast, I got to take you back to that winter that began in 13 and lasted into 14. You see, then the jet stream did that, a much deeper dive here over the eastern part of the United States. And what we ended up getting was numerous colder outbreaks that came from this direction. And it was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was very warm to the West. And we just don't have that. And here's the other reason why. You see, in that winter, the beginning of January 2014, Big Ridge in the stratosphere pushed into the Bering Sea. Big one went up here along the um, North Atlantic. And the polar vortex split like that. Now, this was our cold air anchor. And what do we have this year? None of that. You see, the coldest air is going into Europe. It's here over you know, Russia. And it is associated right now with the polar vortex being there as well. But as I play this through the next 10 days, the polar vortex has yet to link itself up to bring in cold air into this direction. Now, all of that is critical to where we're taking this upcoming pattern. And this is the trough that's leaving us on Monday, all right, that has produced that big low pressure system over the weekend. Now, as you watch this moving forward, what you see is, and this is critical for what we're going to have over the southeast, is that clipper systems cut through here. We see, let me just step you back, we see a cutoff low going over California. But if you notice, there's a ridge feature that's setting up over the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, over parts of the southeast. And what's going to end up happening here is that throughout much of this week, the flow is going to come around the northern edge of it. And it's going to get picked up into the jet stream flow, and it's going to increase our chances for precipitation. But there's nothing about this pattern that says go over to really cold temperatures or stay well above average on precipitation. I just don't see that. And as I take you all the way out here, I mean, this is out here uh, to next weekend. That's when we start to see a big trough that sweeps through. And that one's going to come to the Midwest by Monday, Tuesday next week. I'll show you that in just a few moments. But if I play forward for you here, the high resolution European model, excuse me, not the European. This is the NAM. This is running North America. You just don't see a whole lot happening throughout the day on Monday. Some scattered snow in the Appalachian Mountains. The next system kind of breaks up as it hits the mountains. And we're relatively dry to start this week. You can see the cutoff low I mentioned. But it's right in through here that we're going to start to see the heavy precipitation form. It's going to nose its way into North Carolina by the time, or South Carolina really, but partly into North Carolina by the time we get to midweek. Let me show it to you by that going now to the high resolution European model. So as you notice here, watch as I get out to Thursday morning, there's the high, there's the flow around the high, and here's a load that's going to come through and meet up with it. See that? So as we go from Thursday afternoon and evening, when we have our next chance of getting some precipitation, then into Friday morning, afternoon, and evening, that's when our first round of heavier precipitation comes through. So we're primarily looking at the end of this week at giving us our best chances of precipitation. Now, from there, what I'll be watching, because things clear out as high pressure moves in over the weekend, is the formation of a low in the midsection of the country next Monday, Tuesday. Now, thankfully, I'll be giving you another video before this thing forms. But if it does, as this one comes through, it could really, look at that, this would be next Tuesday afternoon, evening. It could swipe through, bringing in chances for storms, very strong winds, and also some, at times, pretty heavy rainfall. But if we just say what's coming through next weekend, the heaviest rain sits on that frontal boundary right there. See it? And what we end up getting is we kind of put a northern edge on this and a southern edge on this. And the European model would suggest that much of North Carolina has a drier week ahead, but it's going to be wetter farther to the south. Now, if this boundary, I'll draw over it in black here, if that boundary moves at all to the north, that changes our precipitation patterns. This clipper's too far to the north to get us, but keep an eye on that. From there, just want to let you know we could be seeing some light snow this week in the Appalachian Mountains cutting across parts of Virginia. Very, very light snow here. 
Uh, that's coming from uh, the little bit of snow that we could get in the next 24 hours. And then don't forget there's a second shot at this with that next system that slides through. But by day 10, ridge, ridge, ridge. Trough is here and the other one's out in the North Atlantic. By day 15, the flow is doing that. And so what I want you to see here is that this is just not going to have what it takes to bring in cold and leave cold around, but it will keep things more, more, more active and moving. Wetter West Coast, better flow through Tennessee Valley, Ohio River Valley, connecting here with that trough that's out in the, you know, in the open uh, uh, North Atlantic. And therefore, I do think that in week two, we see a return toward more normal precipitation. And again, week two ends uh, on February 1st. Now, what about temperatures? I've got to show you this cool graphic here. I found the coldest temperature we've had since October 1st. And I just made a map of it. And the numbers represent how cold it got in Fahrenheit. We zoom in over here on parts of the Mid-Atlantic through the, 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 the Carolinas here. We've been cold. We have gotten some cold air in place. It's just not stuck around for a long time. Now, today, we're near average, cooler as you get back toward the mountains. But playing this forward, let's go from here into tomorrow. Look at this. Tuesday into Wednesday, we're technically a little mild for this time of year. And remember, it's dry. Uh, Wednesday, or excuse me, Thursday, another mild day. Friday, the same. It's not going to be until the weekend that things cool back off a bit on Saturday here and then getting into Sunday. Beyond that, Looking out the day 5 through 10, the coldest air is anchored over western parts of North America. With the ridge setting up right here around its edge, yeah, it'll be wet, but will be warmer than normal. You can see that both the European and the GFS. There is a bit of a discrepancy going out to day 10 through 15. The GFS favors near normal to warmer conditions. The European likes to link up that colder air into the North Atlantic and brings you on a slight cooler bias. What I'm going to tell you is when I look at this, I don't have any reason to tell you that sustained cold air is going to be coming in and staying in. And that's a bit of a different narrative than I thought last week. The MJO is helping this out. It's going to go here into phase seven and possibly move back over to phase six. Now that tends to historically give us the coldest corridor of air in through here, but it's not even really that cold. We tend to favor a warmer bias across the southeast. And plus remember this La Nina that was going on here. Well, with the warm water to the north of it, the warm water in the North Atlantic, these two features say bring in more mild Pacific air. Keep the jet stream unanchored to Arctic air and keep it north. And I showed you earlier what the polar vortex was doing. It's certainly not in a connected way going to be bringing cold air into the eastern half of North America. So here we go. Going all the way from now through the month of February, the European model says favor a warmer bias where I put that oval and any shot at colder air that's coming in here is going to be just that a shot at colder air it does continue to say drier along the Gulf Coast and the southeast coast but see this active Ohio River Valley storm track see this active Alberta Clipper storm track and see how wet it is in the northwest I don't think it's going to be overly dry for us over the next well six weeks or so I think we will see routine precipitation but drought development seems unlikely at this point, and I, I just call into question those longer range models. In other words, this La Nina is not behaving like normal La Ninas do. I think we need to keep that in the back of our minds. From here, I'm going to give you a quick update on South America. Over the weekend, quite a bit of thunderstorm activity in Argentina. Normal monsoonal activity up in like Mato Grosso. Southern Brazil, good precip as well. It was dry only over here in eastern Brazil. Through the next five days, high pressure dominates Argentina, so they're going to go over dry. It's dry in eastern Brazil, very wet in southern Brazil, right in through here. That would be Mato Grosso do Sol and Paraná. Mato Grosso, which is their big producing state here, which we need to be thinking about for soybeans, corn, and cotton, all right? Better precip chances this week. But going out all the way to the next 10 days, there is a drier region that's creeping in from the east that the models have been picking up on. And it may not be until the end of the week that we start to see more normal thunderstorm activity for Argentina. And really, they've only had one good week of storms to kind of relieve things, and that was last week. Thinking longer term, the models want to bring in wetter conditions inside of that wedge, which again, hit parts of southern Brazil, Paraguay, which is here, Uruguay, which is there, and Argentina, which is here. That's their main growing area, the area just shaded. 
but possibly another drier shot up here. Just to remind you, this is the driest it's been in like 40 years in Mato Grosso. So let's keep a close eye on this as we progress forward, okay? Have a great week. I'll talk to you next Monday. Thanks.